right, well, this is the Reholstered Podcast. Today we are, um, it's a little bit different today. Normally Riley's next to me, and then we have a guest off to the side, but Riley somehow got out of this one, so uh, he's in the back chilling. But today we have um, Jay Wadsworth, the uh, Director of Combatives and Lead Instructor at ECF Effective Fitness Combatives. Is that correct? Yeah, EFC. Yep. EFC. I was like, man, I, I, you were looking at me, and I was like, ah, I said something wrong <laughs> already. Um, but before we hop into EFC, who you are, what EFC is, real quick, I want to hit the promo. If you are listening right now, you want a solid deal on a, uh, you out there buying a holster right now, use the code REHOLSTERED APRIL, and you will get, Riley, 15%. 15%. I have the bad habit of saying like 50 or 96 <laughs> or for, uh, you know, I, I have the bad habit of like randomly spouting off numbers. 15% you will get, you'll say 15%. Also, shout out to, um, what was bro's name who came in today? Oh, Chris. Chris. Shout out to Chris from Spokane, man. He walked in the front office and said, hey, I listened to the podcast. And uh, the, the girls at the front, the ladies at the front desk text us on our, like, it's called Teams. It's like a, yep. you know, communication thing. And they're like, hey, there's a guy up here who listens to the podcast. So we ran up there and, like, shook his hand, gave him some stickers. If you come in and you mention you listen to the podcast, you might not only get some stickers. You might not only get some patches. Who knows what you'll get? You might get a surprise here and there. <laughs> so uh, if you're in the local area, make sure you come see us. Now that the business is done, let's have some fun. Or let's, I guess, it's fun to talk about what yeah. you guys do, right? Yeah, it's always entertaining. Jay Wadsworth, man, tell us about yourself. Where are you originally from? Kind of give us your history, like how you got into law enforcement. Because, you know, I, I did some Googling on the website. You, all of your all's trainers have this massive list of accomplishments and experiences. But just to read a few, you're a second degree black belt in jujitsu, retired MMA fighter, 22 years as a street cop, 14 years as a SWAT uh, of SWAT experience. You've been a trainer and all of these things. Come on, man. That's a lot. And I, that, that's just like four out of the 96 things that's on your profile. But how did it all start? Uh, realistically, it just started as like uh, I'm a competitive person. I played uh, college soccer uh, oh, nice. collegially. And when I got out, I just I wanted to something else to do. So I started like uh, just doing MMA. Okay. Uh, and then I was also a cop at the time. So it was just a hobby for me. Mm. And then I got sent to... Uh, defensive tactics company for training mm -hmm. and it, it just was pretty poor mm. uh, and I just was like this is not the solution and this is not what I really want to be teaching people because starting to do MMA and wrestling and jujitsu I, I realized what actually works and what doesn't work mm. and so then I just started making that like my coursework was like taking the experience from being on the street mm -hmm. uh, which changes things a little bit one we have the use of force which is like our rules of the game mm -hmm. and then we have the environment that we work on uh, and that all that environment can always change so taking that with the best skills that we could develop and kind of integrating them into a curriculum that's uh, not just like defensive tactics or not just shooting a range not just related based training but kind of encompassing all of that with the use of force mm -hmm. and you know it didn't happen overnight like obviously uh it's a grind and it's working hard and you know myself and my the cadre that we've built yeah uh every one of those guys is hand-picked mm -hmm. um they're just as talented if not more talented than myself with as much experience mm -hmm. so as a team, like we bring so much police officer experience, road experience, tactical experience mm -hmm. to also everyone's black belts. Uh, we have all our male instructors are black belts. We have one brown belt instructor mm -hmm. uh, or they're collegiate level wrestlers. And then all of them have police experience and tact experience as well. Right. Um, we have four female instructors. They're two black belts. Um, they work, both work for large metropolitan police departments. Okay. And then my other two um, are purple belts, but they're high-level competitors. One's a pro MMA fighter, purple belt, and uh, a pro MMA fighter. And the other one's a high-level uh, purple belt competitor. Nice. And they both instruct uh, at, at their gyms and stuff, so they're both good teachers as well. So, like, um, that's kind of what we wanted to build when we, we did this. Yeah. Um, it's not just, like hey, Jay's running all this. Sure, I'm the face and people know me the most, but like none of it happens with like 
the high level cadre we have with us. Now talk about that a little bit. How was it founded? Because you have, I was looking on the website, doing some research. There's three founders. What was that process like when they first, that, that, the, uh, the, from the inception phase, uh, what did that look like? Yeah. So, you know, like, um, running stuff for the state, uh, my, my co-founder is, uh, Adam Hadari. He Mm -hmm. runs the largest social media platform for police. It's called police posts. Okay. Uh, and he kind of, started making contact with me and was like, I want you and I want to partner with you and Mm -hmm. we want to come up with better solutions for law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I was working for another company at the time that's really good and puts out good stuff as well. But uh, there was rooms for improvement and maybe Mm -hmm. some things that I saw I would do different if I owned my own company. Yeah. Um, So we partnered together and it it didn't happen overnight. Like we we were in talks for a while before it happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we have two other partners that are more on the business side of things. Okay. So like I'm, I'm the tactics guy, the tactics guy on like the, the combatives, the curriculum builder. Yeah. Uh, Adam's like the marketing guy. Gotcha. And then the other two are like the, the backside, like business minds sets right. of things that, you know, all the backdoor stuff that no one thinks happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, a lot goes on, you know, and it's not just like Adam and I, we're the, obviously the faces, but like, to make something successful, it takes a lot of people. I love it, man. That's I mean, that's something that we talk about here all the time. Is just like the team that you build around you. Yeah, that's that that foundation is incredibly important to anything that you do. Um, kind of speaking of foundations, can you talk a little bit about like the almost like the foundational ethos or like the mission or the um, what drives EFC? Yeah, what drives EFC first of all is passion to make police officers safe and better. Mm-hmm. You know obviously for, for everybody involved. Uh, we want cops to go home, uh, but we also want them to have better solutions and tactics so that even suspects are, are in, in a safer situation mm. as well. Yeah. Um, so understanding that providing a solution rather than saying, oh, what we're doing is failing, but not having a solution to provide. Yeah. So we really pride ourselves on providing a solution and our curriculum is a full spectrum curriculum. So it's not just DT, it's not just range. Mm -hmm. Uh, We bring it all together with the use of force and no other companies are really bringing it all together exactly like how EFC is doing. And you know, the old school thought process is, okay, you have DT guys and you have gun guys. Mm. They're not on the same page. The DT guys like, I don't need to shoot well. I just need to pass quals because I got really good hands-on skills. Right. The gun guy's like, I don't need DT because I got a gun. Mm-hmm. One, y- your gun is the solution in very few use of forces anyways as, mm-hmm. a, as a whole. Um, and two, like, if you're in a closet or a confined space, like, it's not as easy as I'm just going to get my gun out and solve the problem that yeah. way. Right. And they find that out like in our courses as well. It's very difficult to draw. But mm. the DT guys find that out as also. I'm just a, I'm a black belt. I don't shoot well at the range yeah. i shoot a 70 on paper so i still suck at shooting yeah, yeah. for our civilians what's dt uh defensive tactics gotcha. um we we don't name ourselves defensive tactics because we are combatives and that is everything that's involved in some sort of force so, well and that's 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 a piece of um what i wanted to ask you too is what what was the uh i like there's a quote on your website that you your quote is specifically it says ecf uh, our EFC, sorry, uh, derived because we saw the broken model of combatives training in law enforcement or in the law enforcement profession. Can you talk real quick about what was the like traditional combatives model in comparison to kind of what you all are doing? Yeah. So basically defensive taxes are more like, okay, control, striking, taking people in custody for like your hands on stuff. Mm. Then Maybe you have a block where you do pepper spray and then taser separate mm. and then range is completely separate. Right. Okay. And then if none of those instructors are teaching on the same page and range is teaching weapon manipulation in one format and DT is teaching weapon manipulation off of uh, retention and, and uh, tactics in a different. Now you have guys teaching different things in the same department or in the same academy. Mm. So everything was so gun guy, DT guy and realistically in a real incident, a real force incident, a gun problem becomes a hands-on problem at any time. Mm. My hands-on problem can become a gun problem in less than a second. Yeah. So like we have to understand that anytime force is used, force is never pretty. Mm-hmm. But the more skills we have, the more tactics we have, force options can be a form of de-escalation. Mm-hmm. If we use a reasonable amount of force necessary, okay, it might not look pretty, but it might stop it from going from, hey, we're in a hands-out fight to us taking you down hard and gaining good control mm-hmm. versus 
we get in a fight and we can't control you and then you start to present a weapon and we have to end up engaging mm -hmm. uh now that went from uh an actively combative person to a deadly physical force incident mm. um if we have good team tactics maybe two or three guys can take this guy down and control him yeah okay and then it doesn't become a deadly physical force incident now there are some incidents where you don't have a, a chance, you don't have time, it is deadly physical force right away, right. and that's what's presented is to protect yourself mm -hmm. and or somebody else, okay? Unfortunately, that is a choice of the suspect. Yeah. But a lot of times those will escalate just because of not the reasonable amount of force, they use too much force or they don't have enough force or they just uh, don't know how to handle the situation. Mm. And so now the fight starts in happen people get stressed out fear happens they get scared yep. and then and then you know maybe they don't have as good of choices they they could be in the right level of force it just is inefficient so it looks like an overuse of force but when you break it down it probably isn't mm. it just gives that appearance of so we want the solution of okay we need to understand use of force first off we need mm -hmm. to know like what is our case laws what are our state laws yeah. um what are our general orders because mm -hmm. those will usually restrict you more and that was that was one of the interesting things that i saw when i was kind of just doing research was like the combination of different um aspects that you guys are coming at combatives from you know whether it be like you said case law um, jiu jitsu, like right. all of these things coming together in one train is yeah. wild to me. But and, and that's like why all our instructors are cops too, mm -hmm. or retired cops, or have police officer experience. They yeah. were cops for ten years and then they moved on, or but they understand the environment they work in, mm -hmm. and they have a super high skill set in the mixed martial arts side. Yeah, because you need both. If you never worked on the street, you don't mm -hmm. understand bridging the gap of what martial arts mma jiu-jitsu wrestling striking tactics work mm -hmm. but they might not be the best option for that environment mm -hmm. at that time yeah okay so now these guys have the experience on both sides yeah that's the importance of how you build your cadre is having the importance of hey we have the knowledge on both sides of the the paper here yeah we can we can do jujitsu we can do martial arts we can do mma but we also are police officers we know the use of force and we know tactics mm. so now how do we blend those together to make yeah. the best solution to put out there it's also interesting because you were telling me before like uh andrew who's who's here like a, a lot of your team members most of your team members it seems like aren't in the same location so you have um it, it's it's almost like you have from different the the aspect of like different regions correct yeah. you might be dealing with something in new york that's completely different than what you're dealing with in florida which may be completely different with, than what you're dealing with in independence missouri or wherever else um how do you all pick you, you mentioned before about picking that the the specific folks handpicking those specific folks who are going to be in your all's uh cadre what what does that process look like for you all so one i, I want them to be high level uh, jiu-jitsu or wrestling uh, mm -hmm. and their personal experiences because those are the skills that we need to integrate mm. if we're skilled tactics are easy mm. adding tactics is easy to skills then they have to be uh law enforcement experience so they understand the environment that we work on they understand the weapons that we have they understand how they have to deal with people mm -hmm. uh because that all changes things an mma fight is different than a fight on the street mm -hmm. uh, there's no guns in there it's one-on-one -on -one. there's a ref to stop it mm -hmm. um but on the street there's still rules mm. it's just there's different but there's so many unknowns we don't know if he's got weapons we don't know if there's another person involved mm -hmm. uh, we could be fighting on uh, the middle of a street with traffic mm -hmm. uh, so they bring all this knowledge where they can merge them together not only can they like demo and do this stuff they've done it right but they can also now teach it so to be an instructor you have to be deliver able yeah you have to be able to deliver our product mm. so i might have i have guys come to my class that want to instruct with efc mm -hmm. and they come through and they're great practitioners and they do well but they can't teach mm. so now they can't deliver the product the way we want it to be yeah okay so if instructor dev doesn't work with them then they're just not a good fit so we find good fits by, hey, they have to have all the skills and the experience we want. Mm -hmm. But now, can they instruct on top of that? And then are they a good person? Do they fit EFC, our solutions, uh, what we want to do? And do, are we a good fit for them? Mm. And so that's kind of how we handpick those guys. Yeah. the um, we, we went to uh, Alpha Jiu-Jitsu. Shout out to the folks over at Alpha Jiu-Jitsu. Come on the podcast. Uh, and and we, we got to see all of this in action the other day. And uh, <laughs> I think one of the things that, like, 
uh, we were talking about this after the fact. One of the things that like stood out the most was the knife work. Oh yeah, like the idea of getting in an uh, altercation or a fight, whatever you want to call it, with that knife. Just seeing the officers going back, you getting cut. Like like it seems like there's no way around it. You getting cut somehow. Um, when it comes to like the uh, when I feel like when weapons get involved, does that does that change? The uh, I don't know if mindset is the right thing, but does that change it for you immediately, or are you still are you still going through the same processes? So so that's the thing. Like if you don't train in that environment with weapons all the time, yeah. say you go to the academy, and this is a broken uh, model of our profession, mm. is you go to the academy, you get 40, 80 hours of defensive tactics training, 40, 80 hours of range training, mm-hmm. and then you go on to work for your department. And then in-service isn't mandated by the states, Mm -hmm. by the federal government. Uh, So you might not do hands-on defensive tax train the rest of your career Mm -hmm. at some places. So, like, how are you going to be good at it if you don't do it continuously, Mm -hmm. right? So training continuously is real true, the true police reform that we need to push for. And that's got to be done through legislation because admins aren't going to do that. People aren't going to train on their own yeah. uh, if they're not forced to do that, or admins aren't going to pay the guys to train mm. if the legislation doesn't force them to pay them to train. Do civilians need to be asking for that? Is that something that yeah. as a civilian, as a tax, as a yes. taxpayer, I should be saying like, "Hey, like we want you to be, we, I, I want my tax dollars to go more towards your training." Yeah, civilians for the most part, think police, when I testify and I talk to other civilians, they think that police are trained robots, like highly trained individuals, mm-hmm. where realistically, like they get the basic training in the academy. And then a lot of times just basic patrol doesn't get hardly any training after that. Mm-hmm. Now your specialty units, like Andrew's uh, full-time SWAT guy, yeah. they train every day if they're not doing missions and research, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so like understanding that he's getting to train all the time so you put him in a situation Mm -hmm. he's going to handle that the best the situation should be handled compared to a street cop that's not used to training and not in those situations now stress and fear still are still are reactions of the human being right Right. like and they they're going to react to that fear and if they're not used to being there they could make poor decisions Mm. um we in law enforcement say distance gives us time time allows us more options and better decisions under stress. Mm. But what if we don't have distance? Mm -hmm. So then if we don't have distance, that's when control, being able to control somebody, Mm -hmm. that equals time, which allows us more options and decisions under stress. Unfortunately, most cops are average human beings that put a gun belt on, Mm -hmm. a badge on, they go to work every day, uh, they're they're trying to be out there and make people safer and help people, but then when they get in a true fight, if they don't train to fight or aren't trained in tactics, uh, and they get in these high stress situations, um, they're the same level skills as the bad guy that they're fighting. Mm. And then we don't get to pick sizes, right? So then attributes are are uh, playing a factor. Yeah. So like true police reform, in in my opinion, uh, being in the industry for 22 years, 23 years now, uh, and seeing the failure is if police train continuously, if legislation was built that they had to train continuously, mm-hmm. you would see way better outcomes in some of these situations. Mm. So, and I wonder from from a, a, a guy like me, I'm just like, how do I help everyone? How do I help the community? How do I help the police officers who protect the community? And then how do I help the administrators who are trying to protect the community and the police officers? Yeah. Um and it sounds like from our point of view, it's having that conversation of, no, we, we want our officers to be trained more, not yes. because we're trying to be critical of right. what they can or can't do, because we want them. We, I want that dude. To, I want you and you to go home to your family the same way I want you to protect me yeah. enough to go home right. to my family. Yeah. You know, like we're all uh, yep. human beings in that regard. Um, has there been, you know, anytime you say, hey, folks, this is an issue. We, we have a solution to that issue. A lot of times there would there, there will be pushback when it comes to like evolution. Have you guys experienced any of that? Or is it because people understand the training piece of it, there's been like this uh, kind of receptive, and you guys are from, you know, the family of law enforcement. How has that experience been for you all? I think it's just difficult because like you have to have the right platform for like, you know, politicians are getting voted in mm-hmm. to make decisions for the civilians that's that's what they do right like we vote for certain people so that they'll make decisions and laws and and stuff in what we feel mm-hmm. and, and that can be 
different people have different thoughts and, and different feelings. And that's yeah. fine. That's why we live in America, right? Because sure. people can have those thoughts. And maybe like we all have, I think the majority of people in America, uh, whether you're like right, left, whatever, yeah. um, most people have the same end goal. Mm -hmm. We don't want uh, lawlessness. We don't want people running around just stealing and shooting people. Like we want our families to be safe. We want to be able to enjoy our freedoms. Right. How we get there may be a little different of thought processes, mm. right? Obviously you have your extreme lefts and your extreme rights and, and both of them probably uh, don't have the greatest uh, thought processes either yeah. way. But, you know, um, understanding that just on the legis the politicians, the legislations, they don't understand what the problem is. Mm. The big thing is like, well, after COVID and um, all the events, de-escalation, de-escalation. They're throwing money at de-escalation. Mm. Okay. Verbal de-escalation. Oh. Sure. We have to be good at verbal de-escalating. Sure, yeah. That's the first presence and verbal de-escalation is the first uh, part of us being there to solve a solution. Mm -hmm. But if verbal de-escalation fails, you and I are trying to de-escalate, or we have a situation, I'm trying to de-escalate you. Um, maybe it's the cop that has a bad day, he's had stressed out at home, he's going through divorce, whatever. And maybe he doesn't have the time to the, do the de-escalation, and that's where it fails. Mm. Maybe it's a suspect's just like, nope, I'm not going to hear it. This is what I'm doing. Yeah. I don't care. Either way, one party fails to de-escalate verbally. Verbal de-escalation fails. What's the next level of de-escalation? then good tactics if we have to take this person into custody. Mm. If we start fighting with you, you're a big dude. If I was a cop my size that has no skill, you're going to beat the pulp out of me, mm. right? Or you can throw me around. What if the cops have good skills? There are multiple cops are there, and we have good team tactics and an SOP of how to take you into custody. Mm -hmm. You start to fight us. We take you down, take you into custody and control, handcuff you, search you, sit you up, move you to transport. Then we de-escalated it without it escalating up into where, hey, now maybe you try to take our gun and then you get engaged with another officer. Mm. Like, right, so tactics again and skills are the most important thing that we miss. And we, I'm telling you, across the board, police officers don't get enough training, Yeah. right? Like we see this in jujitsu. Uh, you come in as a white belt and it's like, what just happened? Mm. I just got mauled. Yeah. I felt like a baby. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been through... I've been to the first. I've been through the first week of jujitsu like twenty six times. Yeah, like it's it's, it's like the and hardest thing ever. And you're a big guy, done. and then you have some skilled little guy like. Just oh, I hate it. I making, would yeah. hate to fight Riley. Like yeah. just like I, I've had dudes who were like, I'm six two, probably like two fifty. Right. I've had dudes who were like, ah, a buck twenty five just pretzel me up. There's nothing more. Mm. Uh, I don't even know what the word is, but humiliating, like dehumanizing. I don't know. <laughs> now crazy. imagine if every police officer in america had those skills yeah. and then knew how to use those skills in the use of force you're mm -hmm. allowed to mm -hmm. it would solve a lot of issues yeah. it would de-escalate a lot of the issues that get to a higher level of force does that also for police i mean this is this is you know does that also um add to that officer's level of confidence out there oh, for that, sure that training piece knowing because and I, and I asked that because like all of those dudes that i could think of who have put me in big guys small guys it doesn't matter those dudes who have put me into pretzels all the guys who i know who are like former sf or former or, or on the other side um dudes that i know who <laughs> i shouldn't say this out loud <laughs> <laughs> dudes that i know who have bodies you would never know right yeah because you know what I mean? Just like the tape you, bear. You have the... nothing to prove. I have nothing to prove to anyone on the street. I'm mm -hmm. I'm out there, and, and I'm retired now, but it's been less than a year. Mm -hmm. I'll go to work. I have nothing to prove to them. Mm -hmm. Right? I know what my skills are. I prove those skills in the gym. I prove those skills in the ring. Mm -hmm. I don't need to prove that I'm tougher than this guy. Mm -hmm. I use those skills to control a situation when they need to be controlled. Mm -hmm. And you're confident in your ability to control them so you don't make bad decisions under stress. Because mm -hmm. I'm confident even though if the guy's bigger than me and he looks stronger than me, most likely he doesn't know how to fight. Yeah. Right? And so I don't need to engage in that fight. If I can be like, he's like, oh, if he didn't have that gun badge, I'll whoop your ass. Mm. Okay, probably. Let's not see that. Let's not yeah. get you another charge. Let's just go take care of whatever warrant you have or whatever right. crime you committed. And a lot of times, like, that is, like, a way of de-escalation. Mm. And you come in with the confidence of it. We're not looking to fight. Mm. Yeah. Because a lot of the people we deal with, 
you know, like uh, their hygiene will give you nightmares. Mm. I don't want to have to put my forehead in your head and, and wrap my right. arms around you and wrestle with you when you haven't taken a bath for four yeah, or five I, days. I, I, just right? I don't want to have to do that. Can <laughs> uh, I if I have to? Sure. Yeah, no, but yeah. I don't want to have to do that. Thank you for your that. service, bro. Like, right? Like, yeah. So is there a way to better handle it? Now, sometimes you don't have a choice. Mm. You're coming in and that person's beating on another person. Like, you got to go hands on right away. Mm-hmm. Okay. But I, take Andrew, for instance, because he's just sitting here and he's with us and he's one of our uh, lead con, uh, cadre guys, uh, mm-hmm. super high level jujitsu and super high level uh, tactics guy. Mm. Um, same thing. Are you asking the same question? He's probably going to have a very similar answer to that. Right. Andrew, what's your answer? Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. So it's just like we don't have to prove anything. We're, we're, we have the skills. Uh, we always say, like, it's better to have good guys and good people skilled in violence mm. than it is to have, like, per se, people that are out there trying to stop violence that don't have the skills yeah, yeah. when they need it to. Yeah. Because then we see just poor decisions. Man, the um, when it comes to weapon retention, kind of going into, like, what we do here – when uh when it goes bad, I think of a gun on the ground. I yeah. think of a holster on the ground. I think of a knife on. I think of a radio. The other day in training, a radio came off somebody's uh, belt. When it goes bad it, in this reality, it goes really bad. From from your experience, um, what does that look like? From a when you see a holster fail, what, when does that normally happen? Uh well, first off, when I see a holster fail, now it happens so often mm. that like oh, I'll stop everybody and be like, "Hey, look up here." Uh-huh. Uh, Point it out. Certain companies always prove me right. Oh, jeez. <laughs> right. Hey, Alien gear holsters. Look, not just playing, no, I'll, no. I'll, I'll do. I'll do equipment blocks. Uh, mm-hmm. Whoever's running the class, not just you, but when I say me, like us as a company, we do an equipment block. Mm. Okay, and we talk about the pros and cons of what we've seen mm-hmm. on the road in the real life pressure testing, in high levels of pressure testing in the training environment reality-based training, which is using like a UTM or a simunition, Mm -hmm. um, like type of equipment where we're going like pretty full speed goes and and, in real life environments, such as like the uh, pavement, gravel, grass, whatever. And then we scale back a little bit and level one, we go mat rooms is a little bit less resistance. So we're seeing these failures with less resistance in the mat room. Mm -hmm. That's when it's concerning. And it's the same equipment failures over and over again, holsters, Right. We, you said we saw a radio holster break and fall off a belt. Yeah. We, your gun is really important because when that gun holster breaks or the retentions break and the gun comes out, mm-hmm. it's a life or death fight now. Yeah. It's automatically become a, where you have, we're fighting for a gun. Mm-hmm. But when that radio falls off, that's also your lifeline in a life or death situation. Yeah. So now that's just as important piece of equipment. And that's one of the things we hammer on too is like, hey, we do our research. We try a bunch of stuff, um, we test it, we've used it in the street, we've used it in the room, we've used it on the range, uh, and we can say, hey, this is what we see. Mm. Because we have hundreds of people coming through our courses on a monthly basis mm. wearing all different types of equipment, right. all different types of setup. Mm-hmm. And it's usually people walk in, they put their gear on, I look at their gear, and it's usually like, that's gonna fail. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. And then they'll be like looking at me like, yeah, whatever, whatever. And then I'll let them start going out and it's minimal resistance, like say 25 to 30% or we don't really even put a number on it. We just say, Mm -hmm. I want you to just like cause struggle or failure to your partner Mm -hmm. on his first move. Make him problem solve when, when it, his first move, like in drilling, when you drill, it always goes right. Mm. Like, but now if he tries to go for a sweep and it fails, now where does he go? And now he's getting punched, you know, even just touch strikes, like minimal. Yeah. We're seeing these weapons break um, all the time. These holsters break. Your your QLS systems and your G-code systems of connection, they're just weak plastic and they're prongs and, and that stuff's breaking. I have pictures beyond pictures of just training environments where I've personally seen these break. Mm. Like I'm not trying to break them. Yeah. They're just breaking in a low level, level one course or on the range. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, like Alien Gear, I've been testing that QDS system mm-hmm. for quite a while. Uh, it's an, it's a triangle format, which you said today is like in engineering triangles is like some of our strongest, or Austin said mm-hmm. triangles is one of the strongest um, forms or shapes for engineering. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the only one that I see that's in that 
that triangle shape. The female end is the same way. Uh, the plastic, the bolts are actually um, wider than the other bolts from other other places. So it's it's important for people to understand that you and you control two things every day going to work. That is your preparation for the day mentally mm. and the equipment that you wear. Mm. You're in control of that, right? You're in control of that, how you wear it, what you do with it, how if you have to modify it to work for you, make mm. it better. The problem is, is, again, training is very lax. Some departments have zero training, zero hands-on training. Mm. I would say most departments have zero hands-on training throughout the year, okay? Interesting. And now that means we're not ever training in our equipment. Yeah. And we see people changing their equipment. I would say, Andrew, it's safe to say every class, we see people changing their equipment after the class or they're going to change something because they see failure in how they're wearing it or what it is uh, when they leave our class. And, it, man, I, I think of that and I, I my, my heart immediately goes, man, I wish you could have experienced that in the academy. Yeah. I wish you could have experienced that like day one, two, and three instead of like, 236 when you're in a fight with a random drunk dude who doesn't want to x y and z and now lives are on the line that's a that's a uh staggering reality you saw the the knife stuff we were doing the mm -hmm. knife training actually the day before i ran a <coughs> a box drill which is basically like uh the officer doesn't know anything is going on he turns around and he has to just react to whatever's going on mm -hmm. so i ran that drill twice with two of our students mm -hmm. and the one student literally went to straight backwards which i told them i give them the answer test is what's gonna happen straight backwards fell down mm -hmm. and got stabbed a bunch of times yeah. stayed in the fight you know and, and ended up working through it mm -hmm. but after he's like i can't believe that happened to me mm. okay and he understands that i said don't beat yourself up about it i'm glad that happened to you in the training room yeah. not on the street yeah. now go fix it yeah. <laughs> now go fix it right but if you don't know what to fix right or there's not good curriculums mm -hmm. um and i've been to multiple courses where the curriculums are are, are trashed or garbage mm -hmm. the instructors are trashed or garbage uh and i've been in a, to curriculums that are decent or i take a couple things from it and instructors are good or uh whatever it may be so it's like vetting your instruction yeah. but until legislation makes it mandatory to train continuously mm. administrations and police departments aren't going to do that mm. do you would you say that the majority of people who come through your all's classes are like the trainers for the departments or are they more officers i would say it's a mix okay um our level one is an instructor course mm -hmm. but i get i get uh messages all the time i have calls and people are like i don't want to be an instructor i'm like it is a full spectrum curriculum. Mm. Come for the curriculum. The content is what you're gonna use as a patrol officer. Yeah. We also just give bits and pieces and instructor dev on how to teach it as well. Mm. The, uh, <laughs> I always look at my life and I say like, man, how, we live in beautiful North Idaho. Yeah. We, we have mountains around. We talk about elk hunting and coyote hunting and all type th types of things that we're gonna do on the weekends. And sometimes I'll be in the mountains and I just like look around and I'm like, how am I here? Like, how is this my life? I'm sitting here talking to you all. We go to the range and we, you know, shoot guns all the time and take pictures of it, which is another thing I love to do. And I'm just like, how is this my life? Like, yeah. how did I, a little random kid from Kentucky, youngest of five, parents just general, blue collar, whatever. Yeah. How am I here right now? Um, do you ever look at your life and you're like, man, I was playing soccer as a kid. I was playing soccer collegiately. I, now I'm doing combatives all the time. Yeah. Is that ever a reality for you? Or was it planned? Or did you see that plan happening? I didn't see the plan happening. Uh, I actually wanted to be an attorney. And okay. then I realized that I didn't want to go to school that long after I got into school. <laughs> yeah. and, it's like being and a doctor. I don't like dressing up. Okay. okay? And I like excitement. Like mm. I, I like excitement and my day to be different every day. I don't want it to be the same. So I was like, I'm going to go to the academy. Mm. And then when I got in the academy, I realized, oh, the shortcomings of all the training. Mm. And and I didn't know everything when I first started. Right. I was a regular person. I was a college kid. I didn't know like gun tactics and shooting tactics and SWAT tactics. Mm -hmm. It's just constantly learning, grinding, putting myself around the right people, mm -hmm. uh, spending time with um, people on the jiu-jitsu front, mm -hmm. uh, countless hours and dollars into getting my black belt, mm. uh, into fighting, um, countless hours of training people for free just because – there's no money in making it mm. at the time and just like 
trying to better myself, uh, putting people around me that wanted to do the same thing, um, getting better tactics wise, going to different tactics companies and training. I met uh, PFC is a group of um, mostly military guys. They do have a full time uh, retired SWAT guy that works for them. Mm-hmm. They they're high level company they do a lot of safeguards ep and military training mm-hmm. and i spent a lot of time with those guys on the gun side and tactics things on that stuff too making myself better to come back and make my guys better yeah. uh and then putting it all together and it's just constantly grinding like just a normal person like you normal person like andrew that is just like we want to find solutions mm-hmm. and we have the mindset of like i don't want to be average mm. if i'm doing this job i don't want to be average yeah I want to be a professional. I want to be the best professional I can be. And that means being trained. Jay, thank you so much, man. That, 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 I feel like that's a, a solid place to end. That that uh, It seems like that's the the mindset of ECF. It seems like it's your mindset. Like we want to do better. We want to come up with solutions to these problems that are there. And uh, we want to see people get home. So thanks again for coming on. We appreciate you. Appreciate it. Yeah.